Crawl. What is happening, everybody? I think we are live and without a net tonight, straight out of quarantine. Kevin, how you doing, brother? Uh, I am doing good, Doug. It's nice to see you, and you, and the lights are apparently on. And uh... I, do, I do have lights, no internet, so I, I'm broadcasting from my trusty phone tonight. So I'm not sure if that's causing any weirdness for us, but it seems to be working okay for right now. Yeah, we appreciate everybody tuning in because uh, you know and finding us since. Uh, our normal Sunday night at eight time slot uh, has not been quite as regular here in the last few weeks. We've we've Ooh. taken a, a bit of a break and then uh, had a special draft edition. And then last night the uh, the winds knocked uh, Doug's power and his internet out, knocked my beard Ooh. right off my face. No, no. <laughs> that's what happened. You're thinking, what is different about it? It, it pulled it pulled my power lines right off the house, similar to what it did to your beard. Apparently, <laughs> it was vicious winds, my friend. They were they were really vicious winds. But hey, it's Monday. It's pre raw. We're here uh, with a very special show that we're going to get into the main event here in a little bit, talking about the wrestling presidents. Uh, not we're actually not wrestling presidents ourselves. I guess what, we was it Lincoln a wrestling president? He was. He was our first wrestling president. And our, current president, our current president is in the WWE Hall of Fame. So, I mean, there is a tradition here. Both Republicans, huh? <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll let the, uh, the audience and their various, uh, uh, you know, political affiliations decide uh, which party works face and which works heel. <laughs> <laughs> so what's the news, Kevin? I actually got to watch a little bit of wrestling this week. Awesome. Well, good. Then you're you're getting caught up. So some of this, Doug, feel free to jump in. I will I will go ding 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 uh, and and say it's time for the opening bell. Um, this week, the well, and within the last week since our last show, WWE had its uh, regular earnings call, and during that call, Doug, it was announced that Stephanie McMahon um, has some expanded roles within WWE. As most of you are probably aware, uh, not just an on-screen character, but Stephanie's been the chief brand officer now at WWE for seven years, and that's something she'll continue. But apparently a few months back, without much fanfare, her role was quietly expanded to include being in charge of WWE's global sales and, and partnerships. And uh, so just a couple of days ago, she announced the new TV deal for WWE in Thailand. So apparently she's fully embracing this new role. Uh, so more... Uh, Consolidation of power there with the uh, McMahon Helmsley uh, uh, crew at the top uh, of WWE officials. Um, it was also announced, Doug, during this uh, conference call, the the fact that WWE is still looking um, for a streaming deal that would move some of their pay per views from the network to a third party streaming service. I know you and I we discussed that before here on the show. Uh, really, we discussed that pre pandemic. Uh, it was kind of before WrestleMania when they were talking about that possibility and the pandemic sort of put the hold on everything. But apparently it's something that they're still looking uh, at doing. And essentially on this call, Doug, it, they said that um, everything on the network, except for the network platform itself, is essentially for sale. <laughs> I don't like that. I mean, one of the prime reasons to have the network is for the pay-per-views. I mean, I mean, there's a lot of decent original content, but I mean, what makes it such a bargain is the pay-per-views and for them to it, go off, it, off network. It's very much the bargain. Um, I have very, I, I dig pretty deep into the network myself uh, with documentaries and all the like, but honestly with the, and this is something we can look at uh, particularly once they announce any future deals, there's a, sort of the value that's there. But uh, I think you probably feel the same, but when the network first came out, the primary reason I watched is pay-per-views NXT. Absolutely. And now that NXT on USA. Movie. Yep. And there is really a, some robust content on the free version of the WWE Network now. I mean, a lot of the shows I do, you know, tune in for when I get a chance, things like The Bump or, you know, tuning in for Raw Talk or Talking Smack or something like that. E even some of the, the podcasts and things that they do that can be entertaining. All of that is on the free tier. So... Um, you know, they really may be, you know, if they particularly if they move their pay-per-views at some point, they'll they'll want to look at how they have that structured uh, as far as still providing value. Because I can very much see uh, if suddenly you have to sign up for Amazon Prime in order to get, um, you know, WrestleMania, a lot of fans dropping off. Uh, but yeah, yeah. 
we will keep following that, and hopefully, uh, hopefully, at the very least, they'll keep a, a a number of the pay per views. I can very easily see them moving a WrestleMania or a SummerSlam, but uh, they have to know that those pay per views are what's selling the network itself right now. Absolutely. Um, unlike last year, Doug, when uh, NXT played a very large role in Survivor Series, which we have coming up. Uh, it seems that this year the black and yellow brand will not be involved. Uh, the reasoning seems to be uh, backstage. There's this internal belief, even though would they like to say that, you know, they've elevated NXT to a third brand, but uh, apparently there are some that like to keep it just raw and SmackDown presented as the two main brands. And that thought press process is what is keeping uh, NXT from being part of uh, Survivor Series this year and is also probably what led to the fact that uh, NXT wasn't involved in the most recent uh, uh, brand draft uh, that we covered here on our last episode. So uh, strange to me, but, uh, you know, honestly, I thought Survivor Series was a lot more interesting last year because of the NXT involvement. I, well, it definitely was, but we have no Saudi uh, hostage situation this this year to need to bring all this, all the uh, – all the uh, developmental kids up to fill in. So there's that. Well, I guess that's one other thing we can thank the pandemic for. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, Doug, there's some bad news for, uh, for people with two names. All right. So <laughs> as, we've seen, <laughs> as we've seen WWE do in the past with acts like uh, Cesaro and Mustafa, uh, Vince McMahon sometimes don't does, doesn't like first or last names. And bro, have you heard the news? I have, bro. Unfortunate. At Matt least they're not Riddle. calling him Riddler. <laughs> At least, I mean, I know he's a chill dude, but Matt Riddle apparently is one of those folks that is getting a name makeover, and that uh, he's no longer Matt Riddle, and he will just be Riddle. Apparently, Vince likes the sound of that better. And of course, uh, Matt Riddle is a about a chill a dude as they as as there is uh so at least online and publicly he's saying the right things he apparently is completely cool about it said he's been riddle most of his life most people just call him riddle anyway he's got no problems with the change of course he's completely cool about it we've met the dude he's completely cool about everything <laughs> <laughs> he is one cool bro but uh, i guess don't call him matt anymore uh you never know how these things turn out, though. Cesaro's been Cesaro for so long, I don't even think about it. But apparently Mustafa Ali, I've noticed in the last few weeks, has got his Mustafa back now that he's a heel. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, um, and while we're talking NXT, uh, or folks that came from NXT, Doug, um, had, did you hear the news about Zia Lee? No. So apparently yeah. she's upset currently with WWE uh, for pulling her from what was said to be her kick boxing debut last weekend uh she was actually going to be part of a pay-per-view and she was billed under her real name of course but apparently wwe didn't find out about her participation in this pay-per-view until days before the actual event which is why they pulled her and i can sort of from management's point of view particularly if they weren't aware of this i could understand uh, but apparently she's been uh, sort of reportedly unhappy for a while behind the scenes uh, in the fact she wasn't being used. And apparently, uh, reportedly, anyways, went to Triple H himself to uh, voice her displeasure, which may be what has re uh, led to the recent angle where she has actually been featured more recently um, on NXT TV. But uh, apparently there is just a variety of, of uh, issues surrounding her and, and some being discontented. So um, reports were Triple H actually liked the initiative, really appreciated that she came forward, but uh, it might be a whole different story now that she was, uh, you know, pursuing a, a, a fight career outside of WWE. And I think it's probably really too. that just sounds really shady. It's it, to me, that says, I know you're going to pull me from this event. So I'm going to try and do it without you knowing about it. Hopefully I do it without you knowing about it. And then if you're mad about it afterwards, maybe you'll, maybe you'll terminate my contract and I can go elsewhere since I'm already unhappy. You, you know, uh, you know, from, from, past experience uh, and us talking on the show, it does seem like a lot of the Japanese wrestlers, male and female, uh, mm -hmm. tend to come over here with, uh, you know, big eyes and big expectations and and tend to hit a brick wall a lot of times in uh, WWE. So that might be what she's experiencing. And, and, you know, a lot of them do return home because there's a very viable option for them there in Japan to make yeah, a, a really I mean, good I mean, return, return home. But, you know, two, two of the biggest, the greatest, like, you know, where we have, 
we have Shinsuke Nakamura and Asuka both seem to be very content with their positions in WWE. I mean, Shinsuke could do a, so much more than he's doing now, but, you know, he's just kind of cool where he is. I think he may be the original bro. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he it might be. He's having a good time, man. Hey, and he has his, his names. <laughs> at his age uh, and not having to take those stiff uh, New Japan kind of kicks to the head and such, uh, mm-hmm. he might be just very happy rolling in the money. <laughs> It's also kind of, and I would also say, Doug, you know, let's see how this plays out with Zia Lee and, and if they allow her to uh, pursue some of her other interests because, you know, look at the difference in the way that this might go down and the way that an AEW, for example, uh, handles Jake Hager's uh, career. Um, you yeah. know, he just last weekend had a hellacious fight on pay-per-view uh, for Bellator and, and won that. So congrats to him. But uh, obviously, AEW promotes the fact that he is this uh, shoot fighter and WWE is pulling Xia Lee from things. So it could just exactly. different philosophy. Yeah, because I actually did get to watch, you know, some AEW over the weekend, you know, and get caught up, you know, even to the point where they're calling him out and saying, hey, you know, Jake can't be here because he's getting ready for a big fight and all that. And I'm like, OK. Yeah, where they also get to keep their Twitch streams and everything too. So. <laughs> That's other unhappiness that that is continuing in WWE land right now too. Um, here's some unhappiness and just some unpleasantness for uh, all involved. Uh, you know, there's never any good news when I talk about Teddy Hart, <laughs> but uh, unfortunately, Teddy continues to make headlines for all the wrong reasons. Uh, we've covered as many legal troubles here, Doug, on the show, of course, in the past. Um, it seems that Hart was arrested in Fort Worth last month uh, related to a prior arrest in 2016 that we've already talked about here on our show. It would seem that the, uh, since the since since that time in 2016 that the state of Texas had considered him a fugitive from justice. Mm-hmm. And yeah, the Texas uh, record state he's facing charges of injuring a child slash elderly slash disabled person. I don't know which of those uh, his, uh, uh, you know, arrest falls under, but that's the blanket uh, category for the charges. Uh, And then there was also evading arrest with a vehicle and then possession of a controlled substance. Since these are the exact same charges. I'm sorry. Going back to like the actual charge, that's three, three different things, right? A child, elderly, disabled person. It's it's one or the other, right? Or maybe a combination of the two, but it, not all three. <laughs> a child, elderly, disabled person. So I, fe- I figure it's one of those three. I don't okay. know if if he if he fled the scene in a vehicle me- with a controlled substance when they finally caught him, meaning that he might have been incapacitated oh, when he injured somebody. Gotcha. Okay. But these are the exact same charges that uh, he was arrested for in December of 2016. So it will appear his arrest is related to a parole violation to those original charges. And that's why the warrant was likely issued uh, for his arrest and and his return to Texas. So, uh, you know, we will keep tabs, obviously, on Teddy Hart. We'll slot him right there under Alberto Del Rio. And there are many legal uh, law troubles. And uh, we'll, we'll keep you all updated on that. Um, Doug, I'll I'll talk some kayfabe kind of, uh, kayfabe, uh, news now and not actual news, but let's, let's do some congrats. First spoiler warning for people who aren't caught up on ring of honor or impact, but first congrats to Rick Swan, uh, for capturing the impact world championship from Eric Young at their pay-per-view last week. Uh, both Eric and, uh, Rich had experienced kind of, you know, they hit that glass ceiling hard in WWE during their tenure. And now both have ascended to the very top of uh, their new home promotion. So congrats to both men there and especially to Rich for uh, getting that title. And then congrats also to Jonathan Gresham uh, for being named the first ring of honor, pure champion in 14 years. Um, Jonathan just won the uh, pure title tournament, which is the tournament that they use to relaunch the, ring of honor on television when they restarted after being shut down for coronavirus. So um, it produced some great television and I would very much suggest any of you who have ring of honor that's gathered up on your DVR, (coughs) Doug. (laughs) (laughs) Well, Looks like I might have some time coming my way now that, you know, quarantine has set in for me. So, 
Well, there is some very, very good contest in this tournament, and the presentation that they used for it, the very sports-like feel they, they did the, to incorporate the actual quiet of an empty arena into the presentation, I thought was just perfect. The finals, um, you know, are a great place to start if you don't have a whole lot of time and just want to see how it ended um, because Jonathan won the belt from uh, in, in the final match. It was him and Tracy Williams, and they put on a tremendous contest. Uh, and then last, Doug, I'll, before we get to our main event, I'll mention since we're talking relaunches, uh, MLW is really mm -hmm. the last of the major independents and the majors in general to not be back up and running following coronavirus shutdown. And they have been filming TV and they will be back on the air with new episodes uh, November 18th. So here in a few weeks, the entire American wrestling scene, at least the the uh, the big boys uh, in the largest independents, they'll be back on air. So there Yay. will be no shortage of things for you to watch doug while you are on quarantine right <laughs> cool. doug do you have any news items i know you said you had a chance to get caught up a little bit do you have anything uh, for us or are you ready to move to the main event you know i'm ready to move on to the main event let's do it all right it is main event time and doug i know um you you've been you know real world's kept you kind of busy and uh, kept you out of the loop on things so if you haven't heard um, there is a presidential election happening tomorrow. Right. Obama's still president, right? I mean, I've been working really hard lately, so I've been out of touch for a while. I knew it had been a while for you, but uh, so, yeah, if you haven't heard, there is a, a small election happening tomorrow. Uh, don't worry, folks, we're not getting into politics. You're probably as sick of, uh, of, of that as we are, and, and that's one thing to look forward to after tomorrow is that, that will be subsiding. But we did think it'd be a, a good chance to talk about presidents in the world of professional wrestling. And as we mentioned at the start, we're not talking Lincoln, uh, who was a, a, a professional wrestler, uh, or or our current we're president, who, who is in the Hall of Fame. Is in the Hall of Fame. Uh, we're, no, we're talking about the role of presidents in the world of professional wrestling, the, the uh, on-screen characters of presidents. Uh, if you are a fan of a certain age, uh, you will remember. If you haven't, uh, you probably don't know what we're talking about if you're on the younger side. Think of it as similar to your GMs uh, or your commissioners that, that you've seen uh, through the years on on your broadcasts, on your wrestling broadcast, that authority figure uh, on air. Except uh, the role of the president was actually uh, very different uh, than the way that GMs and things are presented. Uh, and that's a little bit what we're going to talk about today is looking back on that era, maybe why it went away. Uh, and, you know, and, and could it even work in today's environment? You know, and, and that's a, that's a, a viable question too. It, it might have gone away for a reason. Maybe modern audiences wouldn't buy into these on air authority figures when they played it pretty much, Doug, they, they kind of played it down the middle. Mm -hmm. They did play it down the middle, you know, because when we brought this up the other day, I was thinking, yeah, you know, I actually need to go back and do some research. Of course, then life got in the way because I remember, you know, back to the Crockett promotions and more than presidents. I remember I remember always referencing like this mysterious yet neutral board championship committee kind of things because I was trying to rack my brain about, you know, where where have, we, have I encountered wrestling presidents in my past? You know, and I'm not really sure. Because well, again, in you know this this brain that's not the most reliable anymore, <laughs> you know, post post the fifteen years of being a fifty years of being a wrestling fan, you know, I, I remember the old you know Crockett promotions and the the championship committees and things like that. I mean, it was JJ Dillon, uh, you know, not JJ Dillon, but Jim Crockett, like an actual president at one he, point. He was actually okay. yes, he actually was. And and Doug, don't worry, I did a little bit of the research. And once I, I talk about some of this stuff, you you know have you for <laughs> I promise you, it will jog your memory because it did mine. Um, let's start with WWF. Um, okay. They actually handled the role of presidents differently. Um, okay. So for w WWF, uh, you know WWF just like the American Wrestling Association, really broke off at one point from the NWA and became their own promotions. Um, but from its founding in 1963 uh, to all the way to 1997, WWE had a president as an authority figure. Now, we all know behind the scenes that 
it was owned by Vince McMahon Jr. And before that, his father, Vince McMahon Sr. So really, in WWF, the man you saw, whoever it was at the time, presented on TV as the uh, president of the World Wrestling Federation was actually only an on-screen character. He was not really anyone that had any authority behind the scenes. Um, the one I remember, Doug, and, and, and see if this rings a bell, does the name Jack Tunney? Yes. Yeah, it's okay. Because Tunney would have been the president of the WWF when you and I were really uh, young kids. Uh, uh, yeah. Like he was from eight, 1984 until 1995. So for 11 years, okay. he was the president. In fact, he was the next to last. After him, Doug came Gorilla Monsoon. They made uh, mm -hmm. Monsoon president. And he ended up being the last president. Uh, because then that role ended up getting uh, re-scripted, as it were, since it is really just a uh, on-screen character type role. But it got uh, put in as a commissioner after that. And then when they went to brands, you know, uh, when they did the brand split, they the mm -hmm. commissioner mm -hmm. gave way then to general mm -hmm. manager, raw general manager SmackDown. And Doug, they, I mean, right now, unless I am just completely blanking on it, there is no like GM of Raw and SmackDown, is there? Is there still? Uh, there's, there's no authority on either one that I'm aware of. Now, I've, I've been out of the game for several weeks, so unless they've introduced somebody for retribution to legitimately feud against, <laughs> there's no actual authority on, on either one. But I think the closest we have is, what, Adam Pierce on Raw? Or, or is he still down? But Adam Pierce, who's definitely not the GM, but sort of acts like the GM on one of those shows. That's the thing, really, with WWF is that they, uh, you know, surprise, surprise, uh, particularly in the modern era, have not stuck with anything for overly, you know, long. It's not always clear who's in charge or what the roles are. Because um, you're right, Adam Pierce is sort of the head authority figure now. Uh, but I mean, in addition to commissioners and to uh, general managers, they've also, they had, uh, I'm ashamed to say, several times they've had the sheriff. <laughs> As the okay. Steve Austin was a sheriff, right? He was okay. Yep, Steve Austin was the sheriff. So they've 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 definitely gone the ridiculous route. But from 1963 to 1997, they played it pretty much straight. In that there was this, uh, you know, there was a committee, like you said, they were kind of a yeah. nebulous, quiet. You know, you never saw them. You don't know who they were, but they just got referred to. But whenever they needed an announcement or something that looked official. They pushed Jack Tunney out there. Yeah. And I think, Doug, if I, re I recall, uh, that Jack Tunney was actually uh, like a promoter himself up in the old uh, uh, Toronto territory. And I guess he mm -hmm. booked up the shows for them. So that's how he got involved uh, as president. But, um, you know, w WWF was different because it was owned by the McMahon family. And, you know, they just didn't present that on TV until you got to the Attitude Era. They didn't act like that was true. The NWA right. actually handled their president situation different. So, Doug, the man that was on the, you know, I know you and I, uh, we've mentioned many times on here, we grew up NWA kids. You were total NWA kid over, I mean, I was very much NWA all the way. But, you know, the NWA has a much longer history, obviously, than WWF. Um, but they had a president going back as far as 1948. And the difference, the main difference that you had between the WWF presidents and the NWA presidents is that whoever you saw on screen with the NWA actually was the authority figure uh, behind the scenes as well, because they weren't owned by a single individual the way that the McMahon show uh, ran all of WWF or in the AWA that was owned and operated by Vern Gagne. The NWA truly was an alliance of other promotions. And what they do, Doug, is that they would take turns, whoever they did actually have a board that was made up of the, the member, you know, promoters, and they would have tenures as president. So when you saw guys on TV being the NWA president, he was probably just one of the board members that it was his turn to actually be the behind the scenes authority figure as well. Do you remember the name Bob Geigel? Because that's the one I remember more than any. From the I do not remember Bob Geigel. I don't remember a name like Geigel. <laughs> well, Bob Geigel is I'm a I'm a you know a couple years uh, yeah, probably uh, was watching a little sooner, um, but uh, Bob Geigel is who I remember. Over. You're like a year older. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a year and a few months. Okay. Oh, yeah. 
Um, but Geigel was the NWA president that I first remember, and he was actually the promoter of uh, the Central States Territory, which we did not get in our area. Uh, right. So I never watched his promotion. But the reason I remember him is he was one of the guys that was setting up the very first Starcade, at least, you know, on air he was. Uh, so he was involved in a lot in uh, title announcements for Flair uh, at the time. But after, after Geigel uh, served his term, uh, which was Geigel was like 82 to 85. And then immediately after that, and immediately before that, in fact, both before and after Guy Gold, Jim Crockett uh, Jr. Mm. was the actual president of the National Wrestling Alliance. In fact, Doug, he had three tenures in the 80s alone, which probably had a lot to do with the fact that Ric Flair during that era was champion so often. Because I imagine mm. these guys would definitely uh, promote their guy. Uh, and, you know, present to the rest sure, of the world sure. why their guy should be the, the guy for the whole uh, association. And that's the name I, I think I remember the most from my childhood in, in reference to, like, you know, uh, an authority figure, Jim Crockett, Jim Crockett, Jim Crockett, you know, even Jim Crockett promotions, you know. <laughs> but, yeah, that's the one I remember most definitely. And when I think Jim Crockett, you know, and 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 his role as president, like, you know, the things that he would do and in, in that position, uh, the thing that really comes to me is um, when he announced the the Jim Crockett Senior Memorial Cup tournament. Um, if you remember that tag team tournament at the time, they presented it as a big deal. The winner of the cup the, that they presented would also get a million dollars, and they brought in teams from around the world, from New Japan, all these exotic area, areas to me at the time, and I'm sure to you too when we're oh, – yeah. The wrestling world was so much smaller, so we would just read about these guys in magazines. And suddenly, mm -hmm. these New Japan guys were going to be in this tournament. This has got to be a big deal. Um, and that's what they did for the presidents. At least their on-screen role uh, is that they rolled them out when there was a big announcement, a big uh, super card, or there was a big match to be signed. Jim Crockett Jr. would come out, and, and uh, you know his brother, David Crockett, would hold the microphone to his face, and he would get to announce what was happening at the Omni or whatever. You know? yeah, the Omni, I remember all those announcements. So do you think in, in, in a wrestling world now where kayfabe is essentially dead, and that's probably a topic we could do for an hour right there on itself, is kayfabe dead at this point? But sure. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna go with is is essentially dead in the internet age, you know is that takes some of that mystique away and you know the the on air authority is just not there. Maybe that's why the McMahon's have done away with it. And even though all like you know what we have, all the elite are actually EVPs, legitimate presidents of the company that they work for. Why that's not like something that's really thrown out there about them being authority. And it, it kind of defaults back to Tony Khan on that side, just like the, the owners are the authorities now. Is that more of a believable thing in the, in the world where kayfabe is essentially dead? You know, I think that you're, you're really onto something because look at the timetable. WWF and then later WWE, as it came to be known, had a president all the way from 1963 to 1997. And what started to change around that time? The Vince McMahon Stone Cold uh, feud, which we became the whole anti-authority, uh, you know, kick your boss in the nuts. Like, let's all, you know what I mean? That's like perfect, excellent feud, perfect for the attitude era, exactly what we needed when we needed it. But yeah, you know, the attitude there. But as you said, would fans like is there a role for that authority figure? Once it became known, hey guys, really Vince McMahon owns all this and he's the one calling all the shots. Like you said, that layer of uh of disbelief got pulled back and we you know fans smartened up the internet same around that time. So mm -hmm. I think those two things really contributed as much as anything to the death of that straight laced authority figure because after that everybody became a character vince became yeah. an evil version of himself and how many i mean mm -hmm. <laughs> you said it's a perfect thing for its time but uh, that whole anti-authority heel gm uh evil boss character how many times has that been duplicated in the 20 years since vince and, and stone cold Right. Uh, successfully duplicated. <laughs> <laughs> I guess you could make an argument for a little while that the evil Eric Bischoff was maybe a successful duplication. But for the most part, it got it, it's kind of gotten tired, the whole heel uh, authority figure. 
I mean, didn't we didn't we have a, a short run as Kev, you know got my Fight Owens fight shirt on? Kevin Owens basically playing Stone Cold to Vince's Mister McMahon character there briefly for a while, just to try and push. It. I mean, to the point where Owens was actually using a stunner, you know. So, I mean, they've tried to resurrect it from time to time, but yeah, I really think just in in you know in an era when kayfabe is essentially dead, that you know we're getting back to a, a more centralized, you know, good guys versus bad guys kind of, or at least I think we should good guys versus bad guys and taking the authority out of it. You know, I, th- I think there's, there's a cool idea with the championship committee or, or the, or this like mysterious, you know, committee, especially in with our dystopian tribunal um, Thunderdome that we have. <laughs> it's a perfect time for something like that. This mysterious committee working in the background, but yeah, I think the time for authority figures is probably gone at this point. I, I think that and to play devil's advocate, so there's there's two modern examples I can actually think of now where it's sort of the old school presentation. Because in yesteryears, you weren't, I mean, even like when they weren't heels, <clears throat> excuse me for a second. Even when they weren't playing the heel role like an Eric Bischoff or a Vince McMahon, if you had a commissioner like Teddy Long or a Mick Foley, they were still characters and they were doing yeah. zany things and they were dancing. And like when I'm talking Bob Geigel and Jack Tunney, these were very neutral uh, mm-hmm. vanilla suits uh, that you know only came into play and were seen to arbitrate like some sort of issue or when a big match or, or card was announced. The only thing I can think of uh, where it's being done successfully now, and that's NXT, um, both versions mm-hmm. of NXT, NXT and NXT UK. I tried to think to myself, is there anyone even in that type of authority role in AEW or any place else on screen? William Regal has been the GM of NXT for ever now. And he's not either face really or heel. He's not eating up screen time the way that Vince and Eric and, and you know, the commissioners of old could do. Uh, it is more a throw, throwback to he gets involved and he announces what's happening on, uh, you know, takeover or something else big or a stipulation, or he restores order when, when order right. needs restored. Uh, in NXT UK, they're doing something similar with Johnny Saint, and he is very much a plays it right down the middle, uh, wears the suit uh, jackets, and um, it's actually a nice feel for it. I don't know. Uh, I, I do think that the time of the – Heel GM, the heel authority figure is gone, um, or at least just overplayed. Uh, nothing's ever gone in the world of wrestling. Uh, it could always come true. back. But I do think that you could maybe get an old school wrestling president of the federation, or at least a commissioner, the way people are used to in actual sports, for those uh, promotions that really play it as a actual sport if if AEW wanted to go straight up and not talk about the elite or cody if they wanted to actually have a neutral uh president or uh commissioner that heads a a a board that you never see i think they could probably get away with it because of their sports like presentation ring of honor could probably do the same what what about the NWA? Is is Billy Corgan the commissioner, or is he recognized as the president, owner? I'm 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 drawing a a blank Actually, right now. He is. I think his actual title is that of president, and it okay. would, it would be very much in line with the old school NWA presidents in that mm-hmm. the man who's on screen from time to time, and he doesn't. You know, to his credit, whatever you think of Billy, uh, to his credit, he doesn't put himself on TV. Uh, all the way a Dixie Carter or somebody back in the day would. I mean, uh, with impact, you know, some of these yeah. folks get really big about like they become stars themselves and it feeds an ego. But Billy has done really good about only showing up to announce big things. Um, and that's very much in the old school tradition of the NWA, uh, that the mm-hmm. owner and president is actually the authority figure, but he only gets involved when absolutely necessary and plays it straight down the middle. So what do you guys think? Would you, uh, you know, let us know, drop us in the comments, you know, what your memories are of Geigel or Tunney or Gorilla Monsoon or, uh, you know, Jim Crockett Jr. Because there was a time that 
wrestling promotions head presidents. And I had to look up myself. I'm like, when did that stop? I just accepted it as a kid that that was a thing that every yeah. federation had a president. And then it just went away and gave way to the, the characters uh, of uh, GMs and things like that. But uh, I think that there's, you know, Regal shows that if you play it serious, I mean, he's held that for a very long time. You know, he's been a very long time that they've had him presented. Because if I recall, was it uh, was it JBL that was the like original NXT commissioner? I believe you're right, JBL. Yeah. And then that wasn't very long. And then after that, it's been Regal uh, ever since. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think fans would buy it and accept it. It's just again, as with anything in professional wrestling, it's the presentation, right, Doug? Absolutely, it's all in the presentation. So and the follow through. <laughs> and follow through. Absolutely. Uh, so yeah, there's a little bit of uh, a history lesson and a little bit of discussion uh, that hopefully was a lot better presidential talk than uh, than what you may be uh, tired of from watching any of the other channels right now, right? Right. Uh, with that, Doug, are you ready to hit the finish? I am ready to hit the finish. I, I've I've got a few things to actually talk about since I saw it's very limited, but I do have some wrestling to talk about this week since so I actually got to see some. Fantastic. Well, if it's okay with you, I want to. I, I normally hit the embarrassment of the week, but I have a reason why I want to put it last. If you don't mind, you want to do uh, either match or performer first. Sure. Let's 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 do uh, let's do performer first because I'm going to call out uh, Jay Uso. You know, because I love what's going on with the Usos, man. I love the reigns. I love the heel turn that 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 he finally falls in line. You know, Jimmy Uso, Jay Uso. The Usos are on board with the heel turn now. The other Uso gets cleared soon. You know, they're going to have a run as, t as tag team champions along with Roman Reigns. You know, that dynasty is coming together. It's my Samoan dynasty fantasy booking coming to life is exactly you know, what it is. And, I got to call you out and give you credit, man, because when you, we were having our draft special, this was what you were trying to do. So I, I think that Vince and, and the, the powers that be must be watching. Absolutely. We just got to get Joe on SmackDown to start announcing. <laughs> <laughs> get Naomi. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's all it writes itself, and Naomi is part of the family. We get her in a title picture. You know, we have a Samoan dynasty that is running the game on SmackDown and has all the belts. It just it it writes itself. Then you have then if Smack if if WrestleMania is big enough, and well, not I shouldn't say if it's big enough. WrestleMania is always huge, but if WrestleMania can actually be done in front of a live crowd, you have Rock come in to challenge for the family to, you know, to try and set things straight. You And then rock, of course, will put Roman Reigns over, you know, I'm not like the guy needs a, a rocket strap to his back anyway, but anyway, I'm getting, I'm fantasy booking. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I do also want to interject this though, because it's not an embarrassment, but a, a criticism of the way Daniel Bryan, I mean, Bryan did his job, put him over and everything, but the way he was so, defeated and then just beat down after the fact it makes him hard to be hard hard to be believable as a top contender going forward for a while now because you have a you have a tag team a, pretty much a tag team specialist now breaking off doing a solo run while his brother is hurt you know in this the, uh, beautiful beautiful and well scripted angle but and Brian again doing his job because he's the good soldier. He's he's the guy who under with the wrestling mind who totally under, understands what to do and how to push it forward. But I think it, it it again not an embarrassment but a criticism of the writing because Brian goes down so easy and is beat down so hard puts Jay puts puts Jay over. But yeah, yeah, there's a lot of room for Brian there for recovery. I guess that if, you know, I don't know how, uh, what Brian's plans are, how long he's sticking around in this run. I know he disappears for long periods of time. So uh, to the net regard, if he's off TV for a while, he's so Teflon, they might be counting on the fact that uh, fans are going to cheer for him no matter what. Um, good point. But but he is uh, the good soldier and, and he also recognizes a good story. And so, um, I won't uh, spend a lot of time because I think you covered it extremely well. My performer of the week, exactly the same. I just uh, I gave the the tandem of uh, Roman Reigns and Jey Uso uh, that honor, and I really do try the best I can to mix it up week to week to feature other uh, things that we think need called out here. 
this is the second show in a row that I'm going to be giving my performer of the week to Roman Reigns and, and Jey Uso in tandem, which goes a lot to say just how much they're owning it right now. I think that they probably, not just in WWE, I think what they're doing is probably the most compelling story in all of wrestling right now. And, and from two guys, I would have probably not put near anywhere near the top of my list as, as uh, being able to carry something, uh, this overarching that is just beyond beyond good and i can't wait to see where it goes they'd be foolish to not get rock involved at some point doug <laughs> absolutely I mean, it, this, this really does write itself and rock is the logical wrestlemania opponent for roman reigns especially and, with the storyline that he's created he is the tribal chief you know and and you know the really the only like hero that can come out and challenge this tribal chief is you know the great one himself i mean this writes itself and then i'm sure rock isn't going to stick around for a championship run rock is going to do what's right rock is going to do what's best for business and put reigns over eventually when this happens because it has to happen at this point it just writes itself he he has been rock that is has been uh open in the public about uh being willing to come and and have a match with roman so um you know, obviously the best platform for that would be WrestleMania. But as you mentioned earlier, the best platform for that WrestleMania would be in front of a, as large an audience as they can pack because, and who knows, uh, you know, where we'll be hopefully in, in better times uh, come WrestleMania season next year. And if not, um, there's always 2022 because they can really ride this uh, Roman Reigns Hill character for a, a year and a half. Uh, I mean, there shouldn't be any problem with that at all. I think realistically that they definitely could, but WWE, I don't think has that that long term booking down like that. But you know, I'm thinking, you know, Tokyo Dome will have fans in it for Wrestle Kingdom this year. So even if it's not a full house like the Tokyo Dome could hold, you know, the Wrestle Kingdom will probably be the largest wrestling show of 2020, which will set a precedent for WrestleMania to actually have fans in it, you know, in in the spring. At least that's what I'm expecting at this point. And again, that would be the perfect place for Rock to challenge the Tribal Chief for leadership of the tribe. Doug, what about match of the week? Uh, uh, did you get caught up on enough to have a match that really stood out to you? You know, I would really want to say that Kenny Omega versus Penta was a match of the week, but you know, I I really don't have a match of the week. I, I there is a match I have not seen yet, which will probably would probably get that, but because I haven't seen it yet, I'm not going to I'm not going to call it. But I've heard nothing but incredible things from Meltzer on down about the Walter, Walter match on NXT UK that I, I again I haven't seen it yet, but that sounds like it is a, a very strong contender for my match of the week. That yeah, his match versus Dragonov was absolutely fantastic. Um, for my match of the week, though, what I had actually is from the from the pay per view last weekend, uh, WWE's pay per view, um, and all three Hell in a Cell matches were very uh, credible. Uh, you know, were all good to great, depending. Um, but even though you had two shot men uh, at having the Hell in a Cell match of the night, you couldn't outdo the women on this night. Um, not that we didn't know that Bailey. And Sasha had magic whenever they touch in the ring. Doug, you when we did our show earlier this mm -hmm. year on uh, greatest matches of all time, you had that on your list. Their match from Absolutely. NXT. And while I wouldn't say it would reach that level, um, you know they absolutely tore the house down uh, on the pay per view last Sunday, uh, and they had some extremely memorable spots. Uh, the meteora that uh, Sasha did running up the table into the cage, putting the back of Bailey's head into the cage uh, from the back flip that uh, the back bump that uh, Sasha took into the corner, into the chair that was lodged into the corner that looked vicious. I mean, there was just very memorable spots, uh, very high emotions that played off their history together. They're two of the best that, that have ever done it. Uh, and they absolutely showed why 
uh, when they were in that ring together. So I guess the only thing now will be to see if uh, Sasha actually can defend the title, which has been the thing in the past. She wins them and then loses on her first defense. But it was quite a match. If you didn't see that Hell in a Cell match, folks, or Doug, if you haven't seen it yet. That's on my long list of things to get caught up on. So. That's one to watch, and and yes, that uh, Walter uh, Dragunov match from from uh, NXT U- UK was absolutely fantastic, also. But uh, Doug, if you're ready to move to the embarrassment of the week, do you have an embarrassment? Yeah, I don't really have an embarrassment because I again because you know the real, real world is really getting in the way of my watching wrestling right now. You know, I, my my actual wrestling viewing this week has been limited to Wednesday's AEW, which I saw on Saturday, and uh, Friday Night SmackDown, which I also was able to catch up a little bit on Saturday. So I plan to try and do a little bit of work and a little bit of play on Sunday, but well, the weather had different plans and completely took out my electricity and my internet. <laughs> so. I, I don't feel qualified once again this week to speak on anything other than to criticize with like the Daniel Bryan booking, but well, you, what do you you, got? You, you'll be able to relate to this embarrassment of the week because you're involved. Oh, all right. <laughs> so I'm putting on blast here for my embarrassment of the week, the two bros wrestling show. Ah. So if you watched our last edition, and if you didn't, folks, I would strongly encourage you doing so. I'm very proud of the way it turned out. We did a mock uh, draft here, a fantasy draft. Uh, we had nice little graphics, and you know, we each chose against each other. I was the GM of Raw. Doug was the GM of SmackDown. It was a lot of fun. It was a fun exercise, and it's a show that I was very proud of, and I really am proud of uh, not just the presentation, but the overall variety in our picks. Um, but as always, I try to critique our stuff. Uh, to try to improve this show and the viewing experience for all the, those of you who are watching. And I'm sitting here watching it, and I'm like, oh, man, Doug and I, between the two of us, Doug, we had 20 picks. We're building mm-hmm. federations, uh, rosters around 20 entire picks. Neither of us picked the original bro. I know. I was thinking about that. When I'm looking at our choices, I can't argue with any of them except when I'm trying to get you know, the ricochets and I saw what you did with Mustafa Ali, like the, the young bankable talent. We had Keith Lee in there. We had a lot of the big future names, up and comers right there. And somehow the both of us missed it. We're not going to be stallions, dude. We we're not. But you know, I think we were both trying to grab as many. Yeah, we we I, I, and maybe this is maybe this is a flaw with WWE in and of itself, where there is so much legit talent, and you know, they're looking to push and book, you know, because they can't push everybody, they can't book everybody. They've got, you know, and yeah, in our defense, <laughs> as a general manager of SmackDown, you know, <laughs> I have to, I I have a limited number of talent and airtime to work with. And I'm, and I know you're going to go be swooping in to grab people too. So, but yeah, it is a damn shame that neither one of us got the original bro. You know, I'm not throwing anybody under the bus because I I do like all my choices that I made. But there are one or two that if I had thought about Riddle and I had him on my list, I just literally overlooked it. And like somehow when I'm making my choices, as you said, in the heat of the moment, you're going against the other guy too. Like, oh man, he picked that one up and I wanted exactly. it. So now I'm going to take this person. And, uh, but it does, if anything, uh, the fact that, you know, that is a huge mistake because I think Riddle's going to be a huge star for many years to come. Uh, but it does go to your point that there is so much talent right now that it's easy to see how Isaiah Lee is going to Triple H saying, Hey, I've been here for years. I'm still on NXT and I'm not on even on TV. And she's super talented. Like they mm-hmm. almost have so much talent, it's a problem instead of an asset at times. Yeah, absolutely. But that's my embarrassment of the week. We uh, Somebody should have picked up the bro, but uh, maybe next year's fantasy draft. Because, again, folks, if you didn't watch it, it's still out there on the archives on YouTube and Facebook. Check it out. And, Doug, I think we'll be doing another one of those. Absolutely. And i got to say, Kevin's editing of that was excellent. You know, we had some technical difficulties. Kevin pulled it down and put it together for us and made it look beautiful. So thank you for that, brother. Thank you, sir. And uh, hopefully, uh, you know, technical difficulty seems to be, uh, you know, the subtext of the show the last couple of weeks. So it really is a running trend between weather <laughs> and just ridiculousness that, yeah, in general at this point. 
Hopefully so we'll get up and have a couple of Return actually to Sunday at eight o'clock. You think this Sunday at eight o'clock we're going to be good, right? I uh, we could we could hope so unless you know my entire power line gets ripped from my house again like it did last night, which you know can't be safe. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> Pretty sure not. Hopefully that uh, doesn't happen again. And we appreciate you folks that have stuck with us after we've had a couple of weeks where we ha had a, a little bit different schedule than what we're used to. But uh, yeah, tune in next Sunday at eight o'clock when we return, hopefully to our normal time and we'll be live. And Doug, um, we'll be talking something that I'm sure you will have a lot of opinions on as I do, because we both have memories of it. Uh, it is November. And as wrestling fans, if you grew up in the 80s, especially when it got around Thanksgiving time, it was Starcade time. So we're mm. going to talk Starcade next week. As we near the holidays, we're going to talk the NWA showcase and go over those old Starcades. What are some of our favorite matches? What are our favorite memories were? Because uh, back in the day, that was the original um, big event. Long before there was a WrestleMania, there was a Starcade. So Starcade memories, Sunday at eight o'clock. And hopefully you have some a few that you can share with us. Chime in. Chime in. Until then, I've been Doug. I've been Kevin. Go I'm vote. Doing. Go vote. If you didn't vote already, put on your mask. Go vote tomorrow. Exercise that right. Stay safe, everybody. Stay safe, everybody. Good night.